Seoul and Beijing have been engaged in dialogue on both the security and economic fronts ahead of the planned trilateral summit with Tokyo starting this coming Sunday. So what have been the gains of these latest interactions? What purpose does the upcoming trilateral summit look to serve? And what are the prospects of a joint statement on North Korea following the summit? Hello and welcome. It's Monday here in Korea and you're watching Issues and Insiders. I'm Min Sun Hee. Plans are in the works for a trilateral summit among South Korea, Japan and China here in capital Seoul on May 26th to the 27th. For more on the highly anticipated meeting, I, I turn now to our panel of foreign correspondents. I have Jaco here in the studio. Jaco, welcome back. Hi, thank you for having me. I also have Chloe with us. Chloe, it's good to have you back. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Right, Jaco, the trilateral summit, tentatively, the date has been set for May 26th to the 27th. Ahead of that, though, bilateral interactions between Seoul and Beijing have been quite active. Let's begin then with your takeaway regarding the latest diplomatic interaction between Foreign Minister Chu Teil and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Beijing. Yes, well, they both agreed to, uh, to make it a successful trilateral summit, and one would hope so. I mean, this is the first China-Japan-Korea trilateral summit since the one in the Chinese city of Chengdu in December of 2019. So that, that is, uh, it's almost five years have passed since that last one. Uh, and much has changed, of course. There are new leaders in, uh, in both South Korea and in Japan. So there are a number of uh, uh, pressing or pending thorny issues between China and Korea, which uh, I'm sure were discussed in, in greater detail at the meeting than we're told about. But the first one that I want to talk about is, is Taiwan, uh, which Taiwan says is, a, which China says is a, a renegade province that must come back to uh, rule from the mainland. Uh, and South Korea's President Yoon Song Yeol has said that he wants the status to of the, the both sides of the Taiwan Strait to remain as they are, um, with no uh, sudden surprising changes. And Beijing got angry and accused him of meddling in China's internal politics. That's a standard line. Uh, and in fact, um, last week, the Korea Times reported that whether or not uh, there is a, a bilateral meeting with, with President Yun uh, while uh, Premier Li Chang of China is in town, whether or not such a meeting takes place will depend entirely on whether Korea sends a delegation to the inauguration of the newly elected Taiwanese president or not. So that's a thorny issue. Uh, another one is that China has not been happy um, with South Korea uh, siding too closely with the United States in the, uh, the rivalry with China. Uh, last year, the uh, Chinese ambassador said that South Korea would regret choosing the wrong side, uh, and that led to some angry uh, talk back or pushback from that. But South Korea's Foreign Minister Joe at the recent meeting said that South Korea's relations with China and the US are not a zero-sum game, and they, they shouldn't be. But uh, it does seem that both sides sometimes would like to see South Korea a little bit closer to their side. Uh, now, also, Foreign Minister uh, Jo tae yul asked for uh, China to play a constructive role in uh, issue, solving issues on the Korean Peninsula. Now, he's referring, of course, to the denuclearization of North Korea. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi said that China would play such a constructive role, but what exactly that means anyone's guess. Uh, North Korea's Vice Minister for Chinese Affairs at the Foreign Ministry in Pyongyang denounced Jo Teo's uh, remarks, calling it begging diplomacy and accusing South Korea and the United States of raising the tensions on the Korean Peninsula. So uh, we, we get some remarks that they seem very familiar. Right. And against this backdrop, Chloe, Seoul and Beijing also held their 18th economic ministers meeting virtually, of course, late last week. What do you believe was the importance of this interaction between Finance Minister Che Sang Mok and his Chinese counterpart, Zhang Xiangzi? Oh, so as you said, it's the 18th meeting, but it's also notable to say that it's the first one in nearly two years. So the last one happened in August 2022. So there again, uh, just as Chaco was explaining before, we are seeing a bit of uh, relationship and diplomacy links being made again. So I would say that what they explained was the main topic is, and I'm quoting there, the two party, is just commitments to further facilitate bilateral cooperation. So there are two points I think are, that are worth to note. So the first one would be on supply chains. So South Korea is trying to actively uh, diversify its supply chains, especially on raw materials and on key minerals that are used in microchips industry, for example, because in the past month, year, uh, we've seen that it was a bit disrupted because uh, China was the main provider. So 
South Korea has to aim to get something a bit more peaceful and better relationship on this point. It's notable to say that in 2022, South Korea imported $155 billion worth uh, from China uh, in global importation. So they really need to have this neighbor and to have good relationship on the trade points uh, there. Second point was tourism. So they both say that they want to expand and develop cooperation in the cultural uh, industry and the content industry, so gaming, filming as well. But just uh, if we're looking at tourism, in 2023, 2.1 million visitors came from China, but were really low compared to the pre-pandemic mm. level because in 2019, it was 400,000 uh, visitors from China per month. So there, South Korea has a market, a strong market to reconquer and it has been discussed between the two ministers on the economical side. So I would say that all in all, it was an important meeting to kind of kickstart relationships again and maybe not virtually next time. Uh, and it's need, we need to see measures now because it was mostly speech and uh, show of good intention from both sides. And we'll see how it goes. But yeah, it was a good start. Right. Jacko, most pundits, well, especially the ones who were on the show previously, have spoken quite pessimistically about the potential of any tangible progress uh, from the trilateral talks that are slated for later uh, this month. Do you believe that the summit itself will simply serve a symbolic significance? Well, first of all, hello to any pessimistic pundits who are out there watching us today. Uh, my thoughts are that regardless of any potential progress, simply having close neighbours talk to each other, um, these are important trading partners. Uh, the geography is not going to change. Right? China is not going to move further away, nor is Japan. So it's wonderful just to see them talking about a range of practical issues. Now, yes, China, Japan and Korea certainly have some fundamental issues uh, that are not going to change quickly. You know, you've got differences in, in systems of government, uh, attitudes towards democracy, um, p policies on the North Korea, uh, denuclearization issue, views about their, in, their different neighbors and also the Russian war on Ukraine. So these are all things that they have differences on. And of course, there's much more. But the fact that they've been trying in a practical way since 1999 to work together like neighbors uh, is a good thing. And I think we should feel positive about that, regardless of whether or not they achieve any significant steps forward in this case. Now, uh, again, simply communicating your position in a clear way and, and showing your intentions, uh, it's a good and constructive thing. It's when nations who have uh, differences and, and shared borders don't talk that I think uh, things become a bit more uh, dangerous. So we need to have this communication. Now, also institutionalizing the collaboration uh, among the three countries is also very important. And I agree with Ihi Sop, who's the Secretary General of the uh, Secretariat of the Seoul-based uh, Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. Uh, he said that it's an important priority to make collaboration between the, among the three countries regular and normalized within an institutionalized framework uh, so that it can survive uh, and continue despite changes in government. And I, I think that's a, a very important thing. That institutionalization, you know, it, it might start on very small practical matters that might seem inconsequential to the average citizen, but this is the way that relationships of, of trust and mutually beneficial collaboration and good faith uh, can be built. So I think we should focus on, on that. Right, and speaking about relationships, Chloe, during bilateral summit talks in Beijing, Chinese President Xi Jinping and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin uh, condemned what they called US military intimidation of North Korea. Keeping this condemnation in mind, do you suppose it would be fruitless to seek Beijing's support in perhaps uh, discouraging North Korea's reckless weapons ambitions? I would say I think it would not be fruitless. From my opinion, is this stance from the two countries uh, should be seen maybe more as an anti-US move, but not as a free reign to North Korea. So I would say that in this joint statement that was issued by Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, if I'm quoting them, they are saying that they oppose the act of military intimidation by the US and its allies that escalate confrontation with North Korea, which may lead to arm incident and a rise in tension in the Korean Peninsula. So that's really a kind of rhetoric that we can hear quite often from North Korea, especially when the US and its allies, so Japan and South Korea, are doing military exercise together. And North Korea is most of the time saying that this is intimidation and that it could raise the tension and military incident in the peninsula. So 
I would say that because uh, Pyongyang and Russia have been getting closer and closer in the like, current months, uh, this like stronger st stance from Russia was could have been expected. Uh, but Xi Jinping, on the other hand, China is an ally of North Korea, but they also need and they also want some most of the time to have kind of a peaceful relationship in the peninsula. And uh, as Jaco was saying, they have been getting stance on the question of nuclear uh, weapons in North Korea. And then again, what does it mean? We don't really know, but I feel like discussion and negotiation could still go on. And we've seen it with the latest, so in economics and in uh, foreign affairs, they were willing to discuss with South Korea. And so I think that's this discussion can still happen and can still be uh, fruitful. Right. And I think if, if North Korea does uh, ever perform another nuclear test, which I think would be number seven, uh, that will change China's calculus uh, or can, has the potential to change China's calculus on the, the whole situation. Right. Hopefully you are right with that. And staying with North Korea, Jaco, given the regime's rampant missile provocations, quite a number of pundits, again, have questioned the effectiveness of sanctions. They're calling for the need for fresh countermeasure response mechanisms. What are your thoughts? Okay, well, uh, this, this new test that we saw last Friday uh, was of a, a, a tactical ballistic missile system. The North Korea, uh, the, the Rodong Shimra of North Korea claims it was uh, equipped with an autonomous navigation system. So it's basically guiding itself. Now, uh, there were a number of project projectiles and they were presumed to be short range ballistic missiles and they flew about 300 uh, kilometers into the sea off the coast of Wonsan. Um, and indeed, there have been a series of four different tests of upgraded artillery from North Korea in the last three months. But to your question, does the international community need to devise fresh countermeasures? Uh, and san have sanctions been effective? Well, these are thorny questions indeed, and ones that people have been debating for at least a decade. It depends upon whom you ask. Now, some diplomats that I've spoken to said that it's not the sanctions that are weak, it's the enforcement on a country by country basis, because that's what enfor how enforcement works. Uh, since there is no international police force, it works on an individual nation basis. And now that Russia has uh, torpedoed, so to speak, the UN's panel of experts, uh, which monitored and reported on sanctions, evasion and enforcement, uh, it's hard to imagine that they'll be enforced by anything better uh, than they have been. And now China, while saying that it is fully compliant with um, all UN Security Council resolutions and that it enforces sanctions, um, and these are sanctions that China itself originally supported and voted for, uh, it's hard to see China's enthusiastic support of um, enforcement right now, especially since both China and Russia have in recent years suggested uh, a, a formal loosening or, or uh, lightening of sanctions, even while North Korea was testing more types of weapons. So uh, the greatest problem is that the government of Pyongyang has shown that it's willing to, to prioritize weapons development over, the, uh, uh, over everything else, including the economic livelihood of its citizens. Uh, and North Korea's leaders are not willing to talk to North, uh, South Korea or the United States about anything right now. So my conclusion is that sanctions um, and other countermeasures, they're flawed systems, but this is what we have and there's no other way because nobody wants to invade North Korea. Nobody wants to see a war uh, or strike militarily. Um, and so I think given that, the, sanction, the flawed systems that we have will continue for the time being. Right. Chloe, the, the sister of North Korean leader uh, Kim Jong-un, Kim Yo-jong, she denied allegations of weapons collaboration between Pyongyang and Moscow. She claimed that weapons development by North Korea is simply aimed at attacking Seoul. Is this claim, do you suppose, a cause for much concern? I would say it's not a cause for more concern than usual. So the first thing to note is that, yeah, she said that the weapons are being developed to prevent Seoul from inventing any idle thinking. So that's a direct quote. So again, it's classical North Korean rhetoric that has been also developed when they're speaking about their nuclear program. They are saying that they've developed nuclear weapons to avoid their it's American threat, but to avoid any temptation from America to strike their military nuclearly. So I would say that this part is kind of, yeah, rhetoric that we've already seen. What's interesting there is the fact that she's so strongly rejecting the weapon trade with Russia. Mm. So she called it the most absurd paradox and saying that uh, they have no intention to export their military technology or to open it to anyone. 
The truth is, any weapon uh, trade with North Korea will be a direct violation of any uh, United Nations Security Council resolution, and not just one, multiple ones. And Russia is part as a permanent member of the UN Council. They are a part of the ones who have been putting those sanctions and you know, accepting them at first in the past. So what we can say is, even though there is, the truth is, experts, multiple experts are raising doubts on the, the fact that Yes, uh, there is uh, maybe in documenting the fact that there is a nuclear North Korean weapons that are being used in Ukraine. But the thing is, uh, North Korea and Russia have no interest in saying it and you know, making it official. But what we can also say is if it's true and if North Korea is really selling their weapon, it's still a way to get some more funds to raise and to better their development of uh, weapons. So that, that's something to take into account. Right, it if really I can is. just jump in on the, the, the rhetoric uh, that Kim Jong-un used. Let's remember that this year, it's exactly 30 years since a North Korean official threatened to turn Seoul into a lake of fire or a sea of fire. Remember that phrase from March 1994. That's 30 years ago this year, and that threat was made during uh, official negotiation, but at the height of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And since then, we've seen variations of this phrase and other phrases used periodically by North Korean officials to, to convey their willingness to use military force against South Korea. So it's nothing new. Uh, it's not a cause for concern, but of course, um, I'm sure that the uh, United Nations Command and the South Korean Military Joint Chiefs of Staff, that they're more focused on looking for military movements rather than uh, words of rhetoric from any of the leadership of North Korea. So it's, it's actions that count, and, and these are the most important things to look for. Right. Hopefully their bark is, is stronger than their bite then. I hope so. Right. Jaco, moving forward, there's been quite a bit of speculation about uh, a possible visit to Seoul by Chinese President Xi Jinping this year. What are your prospects regarding this possible visit and how would that affect bilateral relations, do you think? Yeah, so first a little bit of background. So President Yun and uh, President Xi met in person uh, on the sidelines of the, the Group of 20 summit in Bali, Indonesia in November 2022. But they haven't actually had an official one-on-one -on -one sit down summit with a photo op yet. Uh, and last September, Xi Jinping said that he was uh, seriously considering visiting South Korea. That's already, oh gosh, more than six months ago. Uh, Foreign Minister Jo tae in January uh, this year formally invited uh, President Xi to, to make a visit to Korea. Uh, Xi's last visit here was already 10 years ago, can you believe it, in uh, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, meanwhile, his last visit to Pyongyang was in June 2019, only five years ago. So that's actually been to North Korea more recently than to South Korea. And China is South Korea's number one trading partner. So you'd think that economically and for other reasons, South Korea would, be, uh, would gain a bit more priority, a bit more precedence. Uh, so I'm sure that Seoul would like to host Xi Jinping here as soon as possible, but I don't know if it'll happen soon. I think a lot probably hinges uh, on whether Seoul sends that official delegation to Taiwan, as I mentioned before, for the inauguration of the new president there. Um, and this week's trilateral summit meeting at which China will be presented, represented by uh, Premier Li Chang, that will also have have a bearing on whether Xi Jinping chooses to come. At this stage, and this is just my intuition, I don't expect the Xi visit to Seoul to happen immediately or maybe even this year, but certainly it's possible. I could always be proven wrong. Uh, now, a visit to Xi Jinping to Seoul would be very symbolically significant. Uh, relations have been in the deep freeze, mostly from the Chinese side, ever since the decision to station the THAAD anti-missile defense system in Korea was made in 2017. Uh, now, while I confess that I haven't looked at trade figures or, or visa issuances recently, I think that relations still haven't recovered um, since the pre-SAD level of 2017, and that's already seven and a bit years ago. So uh, now that the trade war and other uh, frictions between China and the US are ongoing and Korea finds itself caught in the middle, China may want to use, China may want to use a, a visit by Xi Jinping to sort of nudge Korea South Korea gently but firmly uh, in the direction that Beijing approves of. So let's see if that happens or not. Right. And beyond this region, Chloe, Mr. Xi Jinping, he was in France recently for summit talks with the French President Emmanuel Macron. What were some of your takeaways from that summit and what are perhaps its broader implications, do you think? Yeah, so he was there for two days. He was in France for two days as part of his uh, European tour. So uh, there has been like a few points to take out, I think. 
First one was, there was a discussion about trade disputes. So China has been raising the importation tariffs on more, lots of goods from France and Europe in general. Uh, one of the most tangible proof of the will of, from China to help a little bit their economic partners from Europe will be uh, the immediate lifting of uh, tariff threats on French cognac exports. So, which was a good point for Emmanuel Macron since one of the presidential uh, gifts to Xi Jinping was a bottle of cognac. So it was a nice, you know, nudge from for his side. Uh, then that's just a short term, obviously. And they are saying that this is, you know, uh, all the, the change of tariffs is just while they are reviewing the old thing. So it's just, you know, kind of a nice point for friends, but still something that has to be taken in account that it's just very short term and might not stay in the long term. Uh, they also discuss about Middle East, obviously. Uh, both parties say they expressed their concern about the Gaza situation and uh, the war there, but they say they are having the same goal, that is to achieve an immediate ceasefire. So they have been discussing that, discussing Olympic game truths and uh, etc. But the thing is, this was just diplomatic stance mostly. Uh, there was also a bit more of a personal take from uh, Emmanuel Macron there, where he took Xi Jinping and his wife to uh, the Col du Tourmalet, where his grandmother used to live. Mm. So it was not a very good you know, image of friends because it was snowing in the middle of May and beginning of May. But apart from that, it was really a way for him to show a bit more of personal relationship uh, with Xi Jinping. Would that work? I don't know, because on the other side, it's also for uh, Mr. Xi, it's also a way to show that he's uh, you know, well received in France, and so it's also for him a benefit uh, on the more national political side. Uh, and in the end, they spoke, and maybe that's the point that could be seen as more of a turnout for the future. They spoke about the Ukraine war, and France is hoping that China can influence uh, Russia on this point. And we can say that China is trying to say that they want to remain neutral, mm. but still there has been discussion with, between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping on this point. And uh, we could see that uh, Xi Jinping said that both sides agreed that a political settlement to the Ukrainian crisis was the right direction. So that could be the best, like, broader implication. Right, indeed. And I suppose time will tell to see whether their talks will bring about more fruitful or productive uh, uh, developments. All right, Chloe, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. And Jacques, as always, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, well, that is all the time we have for this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. Be sure to join us again same time tomorrow.